This episode is sponsored by Brilliant.org. ASA Open Day 2019, Starship updates and SpaceX construction continues at Pad 39A. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. Last weekend I traveled to Nordwijk in Northern Netherlands to see the Acer Open Days 2019 and get an invaluable insight into what happened 50 years ago with Apollo and what Acer is planning for our future on Moon and Mars and how that differs from what SpaceX is planning. And it all started with a lot of rain and the Director General of the European Space Agency Mr. Werner explaining that ASA can watch the weather in great detail but can't manipulate it yet. Even though it had been raining for hours, people were already waiting to get into the European Space Research and Technology Center or ASTEC to get the latest info on ASA's plans for the future. There had been 8000 tickets and they were sold out 6 days after they had been made available. But what about it? What makes the ASA Open Day so special? I had a little sit down interview with Scott Manley himself, so let's see what he had to say about it. Thank you very much for the time Mr. Manley. My first question would be, what's your take on the ASA Open Day? I am so happy to be here. Uh, I mean, I've been here for the last few days. I, I, I missed out on this a few months ago, but now I've seen like old hardware, I've seen new hardware, I've been able to talk to experts and I've been able to talk to fans that are just interested in what's going on. It's bring people together that are interested in space and people that are all part of space and we're all together making space great for everyone. It's it's fabulous and I recommend it to everyone even although it's hard to get tickets. <laughs> yeah, it is very much. Nice. And he couldn't be more correct. The ASA Open Day celebrates space in a very open way. Everyone can just approach the scientists, ask them questions and get explanations directly from them about everything they do. There aren't many stages. They are just standing around everywhere, getting into direct contact with anyone interested. The best example for ASA being very open was my media accreditation. I was surrounded by camera crews and reporters from international TV stations from Italy, Britain and Japan to only name a few. Still Still, Acer let me in and treated me absolutely equal to the other very professional teams. A big thanks goes out to Erika Verbelen who introduced me to officials, opened doors for me and showed me that Acer takes us, the YouTube space nerds, very seriously. Now let me introduce you to Walt Cunningham, lunar module pilot on the Apollo 7 mission. I asked him what he thinks about SpaceX and what kind of people NASA and SpaceX will need to successfully reach their goal of getting to Mars and how today's astronauts, in his opinion, differ from those that went to the moon. I think that in, in general, certainly, we're, we're much more dependent on what went into developing the rockets to go to the moon. They're making things bigger, they're taking more people. Uh, whereas before, that it was, it was the experimental end of expanding this, uh, and everybody in, was a uh, military fighter pilot. I was a Marine Corps fighter pilot. In fact, in some of the areas, they're much more qualified than we ever were. But it's in areas that don't require the same kind of challenge and attitude that we had back in the 1960s. I'm still alive after doing that, and I have to tell you this. I feel so fortunate that I was able to participate in the space program back then, which I think was a whole lot more of a challenge than it is today. Yeah, I got agree. Definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Can I shake your hand? <laughs> and ASA is preparing that next mission with NASA right now. Where NASA is developing the SLS and the Orion capsule, ASA is contributing the service module for the trip to the moon. The Orion service module, also known as European service module or ESM, will serve as the main power and propulsion component on each Artemis flight. It provides in-space propulsion capability for orbital transfer, attitude control and high altitude ascent aboards. It provides the water and oxygen needed for a habitable environment, generates and stores electrical power, and maintains the temperature of the vehicle's systems and components and it can also transport unpressurized cargo and scientific payloads. ASA is not only working on exploring the moon though. 
there was a full-scale version of the ExoMars rover on display and I talked to Jörg Vago, an ExoMars project scientist, about its purpose and its differences compared to the Curiosity and the Mars 2020 rover. It was just not possible to produce a good recording of it though, so let me explain to you what he had to say. Jorge explained to me that the main goal of ExoMars is to search for signs of past life on Mars. The rover will land on the floor of a long gone Martian ocean. It has a drill on board which will enable it to drill 2 meters down into the ancient ocean's bed. The reason why it will be drilling so deep is due to ultraviolet radiation on Mars. If life existed there, it's most likely gone for a long time now. Due to the radiation, it would be hard to find evidence of it today on the surface. ExoMars will use a unique method to achieve the drilling depth and at the same time collect as many uncontaminated samples as possible. It will drill down and lift the drill up again to collect the samples repeating the process every day until it reaches its maximum depth. The major difference here to all the other rovers before it is that the samples will not have been affected by billions of years of erosion. They have been conserved under the surface, possibly giving us the best look yet into our red neighbor's history. ASA is also working on exploiting the moon's resources for future colonies. I had the opportunity to talk to Emily from the ASA Discovery and Preparation Study. Her research focuses on an electrolytic cell to be used for in situ resource utilization. The cell developed by her team utilizes molten regolith electrolysis to extract oxygen and metals directly from lunar regolith. Surprisingly, most minerals found on the moon contain oxygen and by far the biggest part of a rocket's propellant is oxygen and has to be brought up from Earth. If humanity is to one day have a permanent moon or Mars settlement, on-site or in situ resource utilization will be mandatory to sustain operations. The cell she showed me is ready to be used and can easily be scaled up. ASA is also working on understanding how to best shield astronauts from dangerous radiation on Moon and Mars. To make the subject easily understandable for the public, ASA had a so-called cloud chamber on display. A cloud chamber consists of a sealed environment containing a supersaturated vapor of water or alcohol. An energetic charged particle, for example an alpha or beta particle, interacts with the gaseous mixture by knocking electrons off gas molecules via electrostatic forces during collisions, resulting in a trail of ionized gas particles. The resulting ions act as condensation centers, around which a mist-like trail of small droplets form if the gas mixture is at the point of condensation. These droplets are then visible as a cloud track that persists for several seconds while the droplets fall through the vapor. This visualization shows that radiation is a permanent part of our existence. On the moon though, this cloud chamber would show a very different picture. Radiation is one of the main problems we're faced with when we're spending time outside our planet's magnetic field. To shield us from that radiation, ASA is trying to utilize lunar regolith for building to be more precise for 3D printing. And they already have working prototypes. Extremely lightweight and built to operate on the moon, these 3D printers can use lunar regolith to build complex structures. These structures would act as shielding from radiation and the moon's harsh temperature environment, giving shade in the day when temperatures can reach above 120 degrees Celsius in the sun and insulation at night when they can drop to minus 200 degrees Celsius. This research is vital to make any future moon colony plans work. But ASA is not only working on getting us to the moon. A vital part of ASA's research is done at the International Space Station. ASA had a real size model of the Columbus module on display and I was able to peek inside for you. This is where the European Space Agency does their microgravity research on the ISS. Comparable to NASA's Destiny module in function, it's a vital part of the station, providing space for up to 10 racks of science experiments. Columbus was brought up to the ISS on board the STS-122 shuttle mission in 2008 and has a total volume of 75 cubic meters. I was also able to take a look at the large diameter centrifuge, which is part of STEC's Life and Physical Sciences Instrumentation and Life Support Laboratory, or in short, LIS. So, hello everybody. We're uh, standing next to a huge centrifuge and I found somebody who could actually tell us what this is all about. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacques Fallon and I work here at Tech MMG. 
which is the technology part of Estec, and I run the centrifuge facility. We use the centrifuge to increase the G-level, uh, like you go to space station to to take away the weight of a system, so you are weightless or near weightless in space. Uh, here you increase the weight, so you look what 2G does or 5G or 10G, and this system goes up to 20G. We can test launch conditions, we can test hardware. It's used a lot for scientific research, so how fluids behave, how bubbles behave, how cells behave, how granular matter behaves, how plasmas behave. So a lot of experiments where gravity plays a role, that's what we can do here. A lot of, of experiments done in space station are not space related, but they are gravity related. So, and that's what we do here as well. So we look at processes where gravity plays a role. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And don't forget, it's the best facility there is at ESTEC. Thank you. <laughs> So where ASA is doing microgravity research on the ISS, this basically is the counterpart, giving scientists a so-called hypergravity environment to do experiments. Of course, there was nothing at all at the ASA Open Day about SpaceX, as they're right now just a launch provider and not involved in space exploration, as their name might suggest. But there was one person I could ask about his opinion on SpaceX and what makes them special, so I did. I asked Scott Manley for you about what the main differences are compared to all the other contributors and what the difference is in Elon Musk's approach. Well, I think Elon Musk is doing it with stainless steel Starship. I was absolutely fascinated. I was blown away that they started using this whole building it out in a field with stainless steel. And I thought he was a bit crazy. And then he came up with this technical explanation about the strength to weight ratio of the stainless steel at cryogenic temperatures. And it's like, whoa, it suddenly makes sense. It's not just that it's easier to construct a prototype. It actually works out to be stronger for the specific case of cryogenic tanks. And it just... And of course, it also has better thermal properties, melting points, heat capacity. Like, that's amazing. I mean, sure, I would love rockets to be made of unobtainium and to be able to fly to space and not weigh anything. But this is the real world we're dealing with. And I think that they've hit upon an interesting formula and I hope it works out. His courage to basically say, well, we've spent a ton of money building this carbon fiber rig, but we can change it over to this and have it built in three months. That's great. I mean. I, as a software developer, mm -hmm. sometimes lack the courage to get rid of legacy stuff and switch over. So being able to do that in hardware really shows a devotion to getting the best design. Out of the box thinking and a willingness to change course when the threshold uh, makes sense. Well, I mean, look, they're all government organizations that need to uh, pay attention to the people that are funding them, the people that have political interests. And you know, NASA certainly uh, suffers from that because they have uh, projects that will only get funded if they are funding specific things in specific states. But equally, NASA has certainly in the last 15, 20 years, they've gone over to these commercial contracts. They really embrace this concept and it's done them well for the commercial uh, uh, orbital supply. Any government organization is accountable to its voters. And so the, it's definitely clear that you want the countries that give money to get the rewards out of it. Not they're not necessarily going to do it better. There's many, many commercial small launch vehicles that are just going to go out of business because the market's saturated. But I, I think uh, you know, being free to do that is great. Uh, definitely, it's led to some interesting things with uh, Starship for sure. And I have to agree, what makes Elon Musk so special above everybody else is his willingness to change. We perceive it as groundbreaking or innovative, but what it comes down to basically is the ability to question what we take for granted. That is what produces all these new approaches and ideas in the first place. Starship updates. And while I was in the Netherlands to do my tour at Aztec, SpaceX on the other side of the pond did not stand still at all. SpaceX has been busy installing loads of cables running along the side of the tank section of Starship Mark 1. Now we know what these small girders were meant to be for. They hold everything in place running up and down on the side. This all looks very rudimentary again and very much like a prototype solution. Expect all of this to look very different on the later versions of Starship. 
SpaceX has also lifted the tank section onto a stand to be able to access the underside of it. Here the engines have to be properly installed after the quick attachment for the presentation and legs are still missing as well. The leg housings have been taken off the tank section and the engines are gone now too. At least two of them have been loaded onto a truck and transported away from Boca Chica, possibly to Hawthorne, California, for some more development work. There seems to be a lot more work left to do until the first test flight and SpaceX will have to continue at their incredible pace to finish it all before they can send Starship on its maiden flight. And Coco is busy as well. As you can see again in John Winkup's latest incredible drone flyby, work is continuing in Florida, where Mark II is being built. Double size rings have appeared and a bulkhead can be seen laying on the ground. Work has also continued on a better access road to the site. The open area where the access road is going through will be turned into a parking lot. SpaceX desperately needs this wider access to be able to get Mark II to Kennedy Space Center. The construction work needed to launch Mark II from Pad 39A, which I showed you in episode 34, is making good progress as well. We can already see heavy machinery with the Falcon 9 and heavy launch structure in the background. The Starship launch pad will not be directly on Pad 39A. It will be built in the foreground as a separate structure, giving SpaceX room to breathe and in the future a more flexible use for Pad 39A, as it will not lose the ability to launch Falcon 9 rockets in the foreseeable future. Also a landing pad will be built and of course a methane farm for fuel needs to be added to make Pad 39A fully Starship compatible. I'll as always keep you informed about any new development at the site. With SpaceX's open approach, they're playing a vital part in making science a part of our pop culture and daily life. Black holes, rocketry and quantum computing are all fields of advanced science that have made their way onto YouTube. To be able to understand the whole picture though, you'll have to fill in the gaps of thousands of years of scientific advancement. Does that sound overwhelming? If so, I have a great solution for you. Brilliant.org has thousands of courses and puzzles that can fill these gaps and today I picked one that lays a foundation between what I am showing you on my episodes and what Elon Musk does in his daily job. It explains to you how your everyday life is filled with scientific principles and how you can use these examples to bridge that gap between YouTube and understanding the world around you. If you understand physics, you understand the world. Brilliant.org does this in a very clever way. Where in school you're presented with complex mathematical problems, Brilliant explains things step by step, easy to understand, but still with the insights you need to tackle more complex topics. Matter in motion, forces, energy, heat, light and time. Do you know how many people don't understand the laws of physics? Having this knowledge gives you a huge advantage. Everything follows these same rules. Brilliant.org doesn't present you with complex mathematics to explain to you how the world works. It comes up with practical everyday situations to give you the understanding needed to widen your horizon. That's where Brilliant shines. Instead of throwing mathematical formulas at you, they teach you how to think like Elon Musk to question everything around you. To become an out of the box thinker and at the same time support What About It, go to brilliant.org slash whataboutit and sign up for free to get access to their weekly brain teasers and puzzles. And if you choose to get the premium subscription, the first 200 people to join through the link will get 20% off on their annual premium subscription. So give brilliant.org a try. I liked it and I think you'll like it too. The link is in the description. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? What do you think about ASA's approach of bringing the public closer to space with their ASA open days and how long will it take SpaceX to get Mark 1 flight ready? As always, tell me in the comments. Here we are again at the end of the episode thanking all those patrons for their continuing support. They are the main reason why you were able to watch the ASA open day coverage. If you want to help make these kinds of diverse episodes, join the club. Everyone please give a warm welcome to Peter Filippone, John Milner and Deathwing. You rock! Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, remember to like and subscribe as this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content as this gives me the time to focus on what I love doing the most to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. Thank you very much for sitting down, Mr. Manley. Oh yeah, <laughs> thank you very much for sitting down. And how? <laughs> to curiosity.
So this wraps, <laughs> right, it wraps it up. Does that sound overwhelming? Overwhelming. We all rock. Mm.